These are the federal courts. Do we remember what article? Article 3. Article 1 is Congress. Article 2 is the presidency. And then Article 3 is the judicial branch or the federal court of the United States. Let's read this for you to copy this down, but you need to know what it means. This is in the Article 3. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. This means two things. Number one, and this is what you should take note, the Supreme Court was established by the Constitution. The Constitution created the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court was established and created by the Constitution of the United States. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. However, we have other federal courts. We don't only have nine judges in the Supreme Court. We have lower, or what the, what the Constitution called inferior courts. So the federal court system is the Supreme Court on top, and then several other types of courts. And according to that sentence, who can create these inferior courts or these lower courts? Congress, Congress can. So Congress can establish lower federal courts. Congress can establish lower federal courts. The Constitution gave Congress the power to create lower federal courts. So the, our federal court system has one Supreme Court and has several lower courts. To give you an idea, this is what our federal court system is like. You have one Supreme Court, which is the highest court of the land, and you have below it are the appellate courts, 13 of them all over the United States, and then 94 district court trial courts all over the United States. The system is, if you fail here, you can appeal your case to a higher court, and then if you fail there, you can appeal your case to the U.S. Supreme Court as well. That's how it usually works. Question. The U.S. Supreme Court, what established it? Constitution. Constitution. But the appellate and the district courts of the federal court system, who made these? Congress. Congress did. Over the years, they've established more and more district courts and more and more appellate courts. The uh, Constitution gave them that power. All right. There is a weird thing about our about our federal court system. It is very independent and very immune from outside pressures. This is from all the courts, from all the branches of the federal government. This is the one that is the most immune from any pressures from outside of itself. And it is the most relatively independent from the other branches. They usually do their own thing, and they're not so easily influenced by outside forces. The Supreme Court and the other federal courts. The key word here is relatively. There are ways to influence them. There are ways to affect them. But compared to Congress and compared to the executive branch, they are relatively independent. They are free or relatively free from outside pressures. So what do we mean by that? In Article 3 of the Constitution, it specifically says all the federal judges and justices that will be serving in this federal court will not be elected by whom? Will not be elected by the people of the United States. Instead, all of them will be what? Appointed. Appointed by whom? By the President of the United States. That keeps them immune from public pressure. Our senators right now and our House of Representative members are not immune from public pressure. They have to do what their constituency wants them to do or they get voted out of office. While these guys, once they're in there, people can do very little to affect what happens or what goes on in the Supreme Court and what goes on in the federal courts because they can't vote them out and they don't put them there in the first place. They have no influence on who becomes a judge or a justice of the Supreme Court or no direct influence anyway. So what type of democracy is this, where the people do not have a lot of influence over who becomes a judge? That would be elite. These are, these are supposed to be elite. These judges and justices are chosen by the President of the United States. They are not chosen by us. There's very little that we can do to affect their decisions, because unlike congressmen and unlike presidents, we can't vote them out of office. We, don't, we didn't even put them there in the first place. And this was intentionally and purposely designed, and that's what you need to remember for today. Our founding fathers wanted this court, wanted the Supreme Court especially, to be free from all these pressures from the outside. Next, 
How long do they get to serve? They get to serve for life. On good behavior, they get to serve for life. On good behavior, these people get to serve for life. Which means once they are appointed and confirmed by the Senate, there's very little the other branches can do to affect the decisions that are being made in Congress. The President of the United States right now, Donald Trump, he put two people in there already. But once they're in there, there's very little that he can do to affect their decision. He can't pressure them anymore. So, theoretically, they can even go against his wishes and nothing will happen to them because he can't fire them. Once they're in there, they're in there forever. So the terms and, and the fact that they're very difficult to remove from their office makes them immune from pressures from the president and pressures from Congress as well. There's very little the other branches can do to affect the decisions made inside of these courts. What is the only way to remove them from office, forcibly? There's only one way. They get to serve for life on good behavior. What if they misbehave? What can happen to them? Sorry? What happens if a government official misbehaves? Impeachment. The only way to remove them is through impeachment. And we talked about in this class how that's very difficult. You need a majority of the House and a two-thirds vote from the Senate to convict. So again, very difficult to remove these people from office. That is why um, the President of the United States and Congress do not really have influence over their decisions once they're in there. Now they can influence who becomes part of the Supreme Court, who becomes part of these federal courts through the appointment and confirmation process, but once they're in there, there's very little the president can do to influence their decision, there's very little Congress can do to influence their decision, and there's very little the people can do to influence their decision. They are protected by the Constitution. The Constitution creates a shield of independence and immunity. If the President of the United States does not like the decisions being made in the, in the Supreme Court, there's nothing that he can do. If Congress doesn't like the decisions being made in the courts, there's really nothing they can do. If we don't like the decisions being made in the Supreme Court, there's nothing we can do. When Roe versus Wade was handed out by the Supreme Court, the majority of the, of the people in the United States did not want that. They did not want the legalization of abortion. But there's nothing we can do about it because they're protected by the Constitution. There is an immunity, there's an independence of the Supreme Court. Number one, they're not elected, they are appointed by the President of the United States. And number two, it's very difficult to remove them from office. They serve lifetime terms. Any questions? Something I forgot in here that I want you to put down. Their salaries cannot be reduced by Congress. Congress has the ability to increase their salaries, but once those salaries are increased, Congress cannot put them back down. Why? So that Congress doesn't is not able to pressure them with money. They can't say, oh, if you don't decide the way we want you to do, we're going to lower your salaries. Again, there's a shield around this branch of government that keeps them relatively independent, that keeps them relatively immune from pressures from the outside. And our founding fathers' intention was for them to make decisions independent from the other branches, the other institutions of government, and independent from public opinion. This is what scared the anti federalists the most about this branch. The anti federalists this is one of their main complaints about this new U.S. Constitution, is that we created a seemingly uh, unaccountable Supreme Court, unaccountable federal judiciary, where there's no accountability. We can't, there's nothing that people can do to hold them accountable. There's nothing the president can do to hold them accountable for wrong decisions, for, for false decisions. This is something that's very scary for the anti federalists Because once, in, once in it, they're in there, it's very hard to affect the decisions that they make. Alexander Hamilton will defend the Constitution and will defend the independence of the Supreme Court and the federal courts with a Federalist paper, Federalist 78. This is the last Federalist paper you need to remember. And here's how I remember them. Article 2 is about who? Executive branch, right? Our Federal 70 is about it's Hamilton defending what? An executive branch that is what? What did we learn, guys? Federalist number 70. It's written in the defense of a what kind of executive? 
Powerful what? Remember Rome, remember Rome. So it is a defense of the executive branch, right? But what kind of executive branch is he defending? A unitary, a powerful unitary executive branch. One executive branch. Federal number 78, the purpose is to defend an independent federal court, an independent judiciary. Because the anti federals are complaining, how do we hold these people accountable? They're there for life. Once they're in there, there's very little we can do to, to try to fire them. How do we hold them accountable? Why is this a good idea? Why did you put this in the Constitution of the United States? There can be abuses of power that can happen in the federal courts, and there's nothing the people and the other branches of government can do about it. So that's the main concern. And this is Alexander Hamilton defending the fact that our federal courts are relatively immune from outside pressures and are relatively independent. You don't have to write this quote down, but this is directly from Federal Number 78. The desire of the judicial branch to protect the court's independence as a branch of government and the emergence of the use of judicial review, which will be talked about in a little bit, remains a powerful judicial practice. All right. First argument. Our anti federalists you don't have to be scared of this independent judicial branch. Because number one, out of all the branches of government, which there are three, out of all the three branches of government, this is the branch that is the weakest. The judicial branch is the weakest branch of the United States government. Whether or not that is a true statement is up to you. Once you graduate this class, you're going to have to make that decision yourself. But Alexander Hamilton in 78 is arguing that this branch, you don't have to be scared of it, that, that, that it's independent, because it's a very weak branch. Direct quote from 78, no influence over either the sword or the purse. The judicial branch has no influence over either the sword or the purse. Obviously, these are meta metaphors. Metaphor for what? Military. This judicial branch has no military power. Who does that belong to? That belongs to the president. He's the what? He's the commander-in-chief, right? He's the commander-in-chief under the Constitution of the United States. He has control of the military. And Congress is the one that declares war. Or the purse. What is that? Money. Money, the economy. Budget, uh, taxes. Who has control of the purse of the United States, of the purse strings of the United States? Which branch? Legislative. The legislative Congress controls the purse. So don't worry about this branch, that it's independent. It doesn't have anything. It doesn't have military powers that belongs to the President of the United States. It doesn't have economic powers, taxing and the budget that belongs to Congress. We didn't give this branch a lot. It's okay that they're independent. It's okay that they're uh, relatively immune from public pressures because they don't, they don't have that much power to abuse in the first place. Number, number two, it's weak because it cannot legislate. It cannot create policy. It cannot create legislation. It cannot create laws. That is whose job? That is Congress's job. Why are you being scared of an institution that cannot create policy? Third, the judicial branch is weak because, yes, they could make decisions. However, once they make that decision, it is not up to them to uphold or enforce that decision. They have to rely on the other branches of government to enforce their own decisions. So cannot enforce their own decisions. They have to rely on the other branches of government to enforce their own decisions. The decisions that they make, they can't even enforce themselves. They have to rely on the other branches of government, the state governments, in order to enforce those decisions. So this is a weak branch, according to um, Alexander Hamilton, 78. I'll give you an example, learn in, and you learn in your his, US history class. In the 1830s, we had a president who was very similar to Donald Trump, very controversial, and no filter, Andrew Jackson. Um, the state of Georgia was trying to force to force a Cherokee, uh, the, an Indian tribe called the Cherokees, to relocate from Georgia to Oklahoma to Indian Territory. Um, the Cherokees, instead of committing suicide by going to war with the U.S. government, decides to sue Georgia in the Supreme Court instead. So we get a court case, Worcester versus Georgia, in which they won. The American Indians won that case. And the Supreme Court said, we will not let Georgia, Georgia does not have authority to remove an Indian nation from its territory. So the Indians win. What did Andrew Jackson say? He still won. The 
Andrew Jackson said exactly this. The Supreme Court made their decision. Let them enforce it. What is he saying? I'm not going to do my job. I'm the executive branch. I'm supposed to execute decisions made by the Supreme Court, carry those out. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let Georgia relocate them anyway. This is what Alexander Hamilton is saying here. They cannot enforce their own. They can make all the decisions they want to, but they have to rely on the other branch, especially the executive branch, to enforce those decisions. That makes sense. All right. Number two <coughs> argument. Number one argument is judicial branch weak. They have no power for the military or the economy. They cannot make laws. They cannot even enforce their own decisions that they make. Number two, this independence that we gave them is necessary. This independence is necessary. We don't want the other branches, we don't want the states, we don't want the people to be influencing their decisions too much. This is a necessary thing. Why? Because the federal courts exist for one reason and one reason only. They have one duty. And that is to protect and uphold what? What do they interpret? What do they uphold? The, what? the Constitution of the United States, exactly. The one duty the federal courts have, the Supreme Court has, is to protect and uphold the Constitution of the United States and people's rights. That's their job. And they won't be able to do that properly if the President of the United States, if the people, if um, the Congress can influence them, can affect their decisions. That's why it was necessary for us as framers of the Constitution to create a shield around the federal courts because their, so their one job is to make sure that the Constitution of the United States is upheld and the people's rights in the Constitution of the United States are upheld. Even if that means going against the President's wishes, even if that means going against Congress, even if that means going against the American public, the one job the federal courts have is to uphold the Constitution of the United States and to do it correctly without having to be influenced by these other guys from the outside, from the other branches of government, from the people as well. Because there's going to be times the Supreme Court of the United States will have to practice what Hamilton says is judicial review. What's judicial review? You need to know this in your head, guys. You should have known this from U.S. history. What's judicial review? The ability of the federal courts to take an action, to take a law, compare it with the Constitution, and deem it what? Unconstitutional. There are going to be times where the Supreme Court is going to have to do that, where the federal courts are going to have to take a law passed by Congress, signed by the President of the United States, passed by the states, compare it with the Constitution, and if they find that it is unconstitutional, they should, be, they should have the freedom to say, that's unconstitutional. But, if we allow the other branches of government to affect their decisions, they might be reluctant to do that. So the reasoning Hamilton had is, there's going to be times where with judicial review, the courts will have to go against the president, will have to go against Congress, because they'll be striking down laws, they'll be striking down decisions made by the president and made by Congress, and they're going to be doing things that are unpopular, like what happened in Roe versus Wade. But they should be free to do that without any consequences. Because their job is to uphold the Constitution, not to be popular, not to please people, not to please Congress, or not to please the President of the United States, but to stay true to the Constitution of the United States, to stay true to people's rights. Because what is justice isn't necessarily popular. What is justice isn't necessarily what Trump wants or what Congress wants. So the independence of the Supreme Court is necessary because it allows this judicial branch to have freedom to go against the president's wishes, to go against Congress, to go against the people, to uphold the Constitution the right way without fearing for their jobs, without fearing that they're going to get um, unelected in office. Anybody confused? So the independence of the court system is necessary so that they can do their job properly, so that they can uphold the Constitution and people's rights without worrying about repercussions, without worrying about the outside influences of government. Because sometimes they're going to have to go against the president, they're going to have to go against Congress, they're going to have to go against people's wishes. Any questions? 
So why do we need, uh, why is it a necessary thing to have a, a Supreme Court that is independent? Number one, they're what? It's okay because they're weak. And number two, so that they can uphold the what? The Constitution without worrying about outside influences. Any questions? All right. Okay. Our oldest case that you need to remember for AP government, Marbury versus Madison. I know, I know you, most of you have gone through this in eighth grade, gone through this with Mr. Luna, Mr. Valero, but you need to know political consequences and you need to know what impact did it have in our court system. But before that, let's talk a little history. This thing that Alexander Hamilton refers to, judicial review, the power of the courts to determine whether or not something is what? Constitutional or unconstitutional. That was something that was highly debated before 1803. Not a lot of people believe that the federal courts actually had that power. Uh, especially people who are anti-federalists, they didn't think that federal courts can just take any state law, any law passed by Congress, elected people, and just say it's unconstitutional, so therefore they're void. So there's a lot of people that are still arguing whether or not they have this power. Hamilton certainly thinks they have that power, but not everybody did. Harvard versus Madison is gonna settle that question once and for all. Little background. Election of 1800, we have the first two political parties in the United States. Despite um, George Washington warning us about political parties, the first political parties was formed by his, by his two closest advisors. Anybody remember their, what they're called? First two political parties in the United States. Yeah. Wait until later on. Democratic the second party system. Democratic Republicans would be one. And the, and the Federalists would be another one. These are their first two political parties in the United States. Think of the Democratic Republicans like um, the Republicans today, and think of the Federalists like the Liberals today, the, the Democrats today. All right. These guys were led by Thomas Jefferson. The Federalists were led by Alexander Hamilton in 1800. The election of 1800, they clash. The Democratic Republicans selected their, their leader as their nominee. Thomas Jefferson was running for office. The Federalists chose the incumbent president, which would be John Adams. He's running for re-election. John Adams had a very disastrous presidency. Everybody hated John Adams, so he ends up losing. The election of 1800 is one of those significant moments in history because this is the first peaceful transfer of power from one party to another. This is the Federalists giving up power without any bloodshed. Usually, when one party, when one faction gives up power to another faction, that usually means a lot of people will die. But this isn't the case in this case. But that is not to say there weren't a lot of sketchy things going on. So, election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson, wins the presidency and beats the incumbent president, John Adams, from the Federalist Party. John Adams has a couple of months left being what? President. Being president. He's a what kind of president? Lame He's a lame duck president. His successor has already been chosen. Congress, during this time, and this is a tricky thing, and this is what politics is all about. If you know the Constitution, you can, you can take advantage of the loopholes. Congress is controlled by the Federalists, and they know a Democratic Republican president is about to take office. What do you do? What do you do if you're Congress? The thing is, all the appointments have already been filled, right? If you're Congress, what can you do? Look at the beginning of this lecture and see what Congress can do. So here's what they did. They passed the law to create lower, more federal courts, right? And all the, those positions in these new courts will have to be appointed by who? By the President of the United States. So what they did is they created more courts so that the John Adams, still president, can fill in those positions, those new positions in office. And what kind of people is he going to appoint to these new courts or federalists? So that when Thomas Jefferson comes to office, he'll have to deal with a judicial branch surrounded by his enemies. Make sense? So Congress, controlled by the Federalist Party, expanded the, Supreme, the, the federal courts, expanded the federal court system, created new courts, and that allowed John Adams to appoint more people into the federal courts, more Federalists into the federal courts. And since 
the Senate is also controlled by the Federalists, they can easily do what with those appointments? What does the Senate have to do with the appointments? Approve. Approve it, confirm it. Everybody good so far? So what essentially what John Adams and the Federalists were doing is they were packing the, the federal courts with Federalist judges. Going good so far? All right. However, once Thomas Jefferson takes office, some of those appointments were still sitting on his desk. And until they're delivered, they don't come into effect. The, peop the person that who's supposed to deliver those appointments that were made by John Adams was his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, James Madison, the founder, the uh, father of the Constitution. Jefferson tells Madison, don't worry about it, don't deliver them. I don't want these guys being part of the Supreme Court or the, or the federal courts. Don't deliver those appointments. So of course, if you're one of these judges waiting to get appointed, you got confirmed already, but the Secretary of State just refuses to do his job and deliver your appointments, you're gonna get angry. So one of these would-be judge is Marbury. So what does he do? He sues Madison because he wasn't doing his job. Marbury wants to be a federal judge. He was one of the people that John Adams appointed, but Madison doesn't want to deliver his appointment. So we get ourselves a court case, Marbury versus Madison. Any questions so far? All right. So there's two questions the Supreme Court has to answer in this. Number one, did what, what Madison did, not doing what? Not doing his job, not delivering the appointments, was that an illegal act? Number one. Number two, if it is an illegal act, does the Supreme Court have the right to force Madison to deliver the appointments? So here's what Marbury says. Marbury says, yes, they do. Because there was this law passed in 1789, it's called the Judiciary Act, that grants the federal courts, the Supreme Court of the United States, what we call a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus. There's this law passed by Congress, the Judiciary Act of 1789, and it allows Congress, I'm sorry, it allows the Supreme Court to have the power of writ of mandamus. So what is a writ of mandamus? Those of you who are aspiring to be lawyers someday, it is the power to force a government official to do his job. The power to force a government official to do his job. So well, Marbury says, if this is illegal, if what Madison did is illegal, you can't force him to do his job because this law passed by the Federal Congress allows you to have writ of mandamus over him, allows you to compel him, to force him to deliver those messages and do his job. That was the argument on Marbury's side. The Supreme Court Chief Justice during this time he should be familiar to you all, those of you that had AP U.S. history. Anybody know his name? It's still John Marshall. Just like in Orchester versus Georgia, John Marshall. So the question was, did Madison do something illegal? And number two, did the court have authority to go ahead and force him? If it was illegal, can they force him to do his job? Can they force him to deliver, deliver the message? And I want you to appreciate the constitutional jiu-jitsu that the Supreme Court did in this case. It's amazing. What they're going to do is decide two things. Number one, it was illegal. What Madison did, not delivering the messages, was illegal. He didn't do his job, that was illegal he's supposed to deliver those messages. But they go on further and they said, but the court, unfortunately, does not have the power to force Madison to deliver those messages. Here's why. The, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States does not give the court power of writ of mandamus. They don't, the Constitution of the United States does not give the Supreme Court the power of writ of mandamus. So therefore, 
this law passed by Congress is what? Constitution. Sorry? Unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. The Judiciary Act of 1789, which Marbury pointed, would allow the Supreme Court to force Marbury to order, um, to force Mar I'm sorry, Madison to deliver the messages. That law isn't supposed to exist in the first place. That law is unconstitutional. And if you all remember, what the Supremacy Clause says? What's the top law? There's a hierarchy of laws. Constitution. Constitution, and then you have federal law, and then you have state law, correct? Right? So what they're saying here is, Congress cannot contradict the Constitution of the United States with a what? With a law. Congress cannot contradict the Constitution with a law. Because at the very highest, the very supreme law of the land is the what? Is the Constitution. They cannot make any federal law that would contradict that Constitution. And what the Supreme Court says is, that law contradicts what the Constitution says. They cannot legislate against or contradictory to the Constitution of the United States. Tell me what they did here. By how? Here's, here's what they did, guys. They stabbed themselves. They weakened themselves. They said, we don't have the power of what? We don't have the power of written mandamus. That law is unconstitutional. So they weakened themselves temporarily. But what did they gain in the process? Judicial review. They gained judicial review. They gained the ability to declare things what? Unconstitutional. So this established judicial review. By weakening themselves in this case, by saying, oh, we can't really force him to do anything, that law is unconstitutional, in the future, they're going to get more power. Because this is going to establish the fact that, yes, indeed, they could declare things unconstitutional. They can review the constitutionality of laws and the constitutionality of actions. They can compare things to the Constitution and declare them null and void. Here's what John Marshall says. Essential to all written constitutions that a law repugnant to the Constitution is what? <coughs> is void. They can void laws now. By weakening themselves, they actually made themselves more powerful, but because they are, they're able to claim the power to void federal laws, to void state laws, to, to determine whether or not something is constitutional or not constitutional. So they sacrificed their power in Marbury versus Madison to gain an even greater power, and that is judicial review. Any questions? All right, let's talk about the impact of this case. This case is important because it established judicial review. It established the fact that our judicial branch can, in fact, take laws, take actions, and declare them unconstitutional. They review them and declare them unconstitutional. This is the most powerful thing that our federal courts can do in the United States. The ability to declare things unconstitutional. It expanded the power of the federal judiciary. It expanded the power of our federal judiciary. All right. So let's talk about what can the courts actually do judicial review on? What kind of things can the courts review and declare unconstitutional? How powerful is this power that they claimed in Marbury versus Madison? It's a very powerful thing. First of all, any laws, any federal laws passed by who? Passed by Congress, passed by the legislative branch, can be declared unconstitutional. So. Congress, federal laws, Congress's federal laws can be reviewed and can be declared unconstitutional. You know of one example of an instance where the Supreme Court declared a federal law, a congressional law, unconstitutional. Tell me when. Uh, the the, the uh, child marriage. That wasn't a law. We'll talk about that later. But you're, but you're right, they did declare that unconstitutional. You know of one instance, or you should know it anyway. Because this one time, federal law passed, the Supreme Court says, hold on, 
That's unconstitutional. Think. Think of all the cases we've talked about in this class. Think of a federal law. Oh, the, the, the gun-free school zone. The gun-free school zone. What did they say? That power belongs to who? The states. The states. That power belongs to the states, so that law is unconstitutional. Congress, the federal Congress cannot pass that law, that law is unconstitutional. So the Gun Free School Zone Act declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, and that is an example of a federal law being declared null and void by the courts. Alright, I forgot what the P stands for. Oh, the President. Presidential actions can be declared unconstitutional. Presidential actions can be declared unconstitutional. Right now, President Trump, in order to build his wall, I don't know if you heard the news yesterday, he's threatening presidential action so that he can get funds that, that Congress allocated to, to departments and agencies, different departments of agencies. If he declares that there's a national emergency, that immigration is a national emergency, then he can tap it into emergency funds that was given by Congress a long time ago to a lot of these departments and agencies. The only hope that people have would be the court stepping in and saying that's unconstitutional. But otherwise, there's very little Congress can do about it. But presidential action. Give me an example of a presidential action that can be declared unconstitutional. What happened to Trump's travel ban? They got declared unconstitutional. So Trump's travel ban will be an example of one. So presidential actions. Like executive orders, like an executive order, the travel ban was an executive order that was struck down by the courts. So an executive order is not all powerful. The courts can step in and say that's unconstitutional. So an example would be executive orders, executive agreements can be declared unconstitutional. Different actions made by the President of the United States can be declared unconstitutional. Why is it unlikely for the court to do that with this, uh, with this wall? But no, because it's the, the Republicans have majority in the Supreme Court. It's uh, five to four. There's five conservatives in the Supreme Court to four liberals in the Supreme Court. So it's unlikely that they would do something against the president. Although they can, and what are the consequences for the Supreme Court of going against the president? Nothing. But ideology-wise, belief-wise, they're probably going to support the president. Any questions so far? Next, federal bureaucracy. The departments and agencies of the federal bureaucracy are also in danger of getting judicial reviewed. What agencies and and um, what agencies and departments do is they create what we call regulations. They create rules and regulations for a certain business. Like for example, who creates regulations to make sure that there's not a lot of pollution that affects the environment? Which agency does that? Who creates those rules to protect our environment? Which agency protects the environment? EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. So they create rules and regulations that would protect the environment. Uh, who, prote who makes rules and regulation about drugs and food? The FDA, the Food and Drug Industry, those regulations can be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Like, for example, the EPA, for example, if it wants to reduce carbon um, pollution, it can say, you know what, we're going to kill half the country. That's going to be the rule, the regulation that we're going to make so that we can achieve this goal of protecting the environment. That will be declared unconstitutional by the courts. So, federal bureaucracies, regulations, the rules and regulations that make, are subject to judicial review also. And then the one that gets affected by it the most because they misbehave the most, does the S stand for? States. States are the ones that misbehave the most, so they're always the ones subject to um, judicial review. I'll give me an example. In this class, we talked about three cases already dealing with state law being struck down through judicial review. Two of them the bank. are about what? One of them is about the bank. What is that called? Uh, McCulloch versus Maryland, right? Maryland tried to do what? Tax, Tax the bank in the United States. They said, no, no, that's unconstitutional. What's the other two cases? Gerrymandering, redistricting. Baker versus Carr, 
where they said, oh, you have to re redistrict, you haven't redistricted in a while, you have to make your districts equal in population, and what else? What's the last gerrymandering case we're talking about? Racial gerrymandering, which is? Shaw versus Reno. You guys forget a lot. Shaw versus Reno. Racial gerrymandering is unconstitutional. And the example I gave you in the very beginning, Roe versus Wade, that was a Texas law declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So they're the ones that misbehave the most. That's why they're always subject of judicial review. All right, guys, you got homework over the weekend. Do it tonight so you don't have to worry about it over the weekend. Tomorrow is your prep session. Please come. 100 points on a quiz grade and 10 points on a test grade. Uh, wait, what time? 9 to 12. I'm oh, sorry, 8.30 to 12. 8.30 to 12. Make sure you come on time. You can't go. Sorry? You can't go. You can't go. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Are you guys on the same group? Yeah. Finish whatever you have you start where you left off. It doesn't matter because I got your information, so just continue. Yeah. Ignore the ones you've already done.